I have not experienced the force, or, uh, but uh, in my childhood, I am the product of uh, uh, coming from a family where my parents separated, and I know the pain of growing up uh, in a family that parents are separated. The wound is deep. The childhood uh, trauma is there, and even I still experiencing the wound until today. That is still affected me today. But I am thankful for whatever happened in the past. If it is not because of that, probably I, I, I am not a believer today. Shalom ladies, I'm so glad to see you again in lesson 13 today. Continuing the teaching of Jesus Christ, or the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we will continue Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 until 38. It is week 6, uh, day 1 and day 2 in your book, The Way. And um, there are so many verses, uh, Bible verses for this lesson. Um, there is no time that I if I have to cover all of the subject, um, that's why I would like to encourage you to uh, study the book and uh, do your homework so that you will not miss out uh, anything. I will just pick two topics from all those uh, Bible passages for this lesson 13. Um, before we begin, let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for your love and kindness and mercy and grace to us that in your message father that you are continuing to invite us into personal relationship with you that even um, today in the lesson today about uh, divorce that even through that that you are extending grace that you are giving us the message of hope inviting us to come to you um, for hope for grace for comfort from the pain in life that we go through and we are so thankful father that we have a god like you that loves us so much that care cares for us so much that even in our deep pain that you are there that you are uh, that you are a god that cares for our pain and extending that comfort and grace and hope in jesus name Thank you, Father. In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. So, for lesson 13, um, actually, there are um, so many topics, right? From verse 27 to 30, it is about adultery. Jesus is teaching about the adultery. And then from verse 31 to 32, it's about divorce. And this is the topic that uh, I would pick to teach today because this, this is the topic that uh, seldom being taught. And uh, not many Christians know about uh, what is the teaching of the Bible um, about divorce. And this is the teaching from Jesus Christ himself. And then verse 33 to 37 is about oath. 38 to 42 is about eye for an eye. And then verse 43 to 48, it's about forgiveness. And I will also talk about forgiveness. So uh, for today's lesson, I will pick uh, the topic about divorce and forgiveness because it's related, right? Uh, divorce and forgiveness. So the main text that uh, we will go through today, it's from Matthew chapter 5, verse 31 to 32. This is Jesus saying, It was also said, Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. In this Matthew 5, Jesus is giving the exceptional clause, meaning that divorce is allowed on the ground if there is sexual immorality or, or adultery. And... Um, the exceptional clause is in verse 32 when Jesus said, except on the ground of sexual immorality. And then where is the reference for verse 31? Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Actually, Jesus is going back to the Old Testament. It is from Deuteronomy uh, 24, verse 1. Uh, 
It says that if a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. Um, in the Old Testament, in this Deuteronomy chapter 24, Moses is actually kind of like regulating, asking the husband who is divorcing the wife to give this certificate of divorce. Why is that? Uh, because at that time, uh, during that time, women is just like a property. Uh, once they get married to a man, that he, she become the property of the, of the man, the husband. If the husband is divorcing her without the certificate of divorce, that means she cannot uh, remarry, then her life will be uh, difficult. There's no future because at that time, women are not working like today that in today's context, women are, are very successful, they can earn for themselves. But during that time, women's status is very low and there is, they, they cannot work. They are fully 100% depending on their father, fathers before they get married. But after they get married, they are fully dependent on the husband. So when the husband divorce them, um, there's no future if uh, they cannot remarry. That's why Actually, the law is given by Moses to protect the weak, to protect the, the women uh, so that they still can have livelihood after the husband um, abandoned them. So this is the background that Jesus is quoting from the Old Testament. And if we see divorce in the New Testament, what are uh, the passages in the New Testament and who are the people that talk about divorce? Uh, there are two uh, people in the New Testament that uh, talk about divorce is Jesus and Apostle Paul. And uh, on the left side, on, this, on, the, on your slide, there are four places where Jesus talk about divorce. It's in Matthew 5, verse 31 to 32. This is our main text. And then Matthew 19, verse 3 to 10, to 10, and then Mark 10, verse 2 to 12, and then Luke 16 to 18. And then uh, Paul also talked about um, divorce in uh, his epistles. Um, basically, in Christianity, in, in the Bible, that a woman or a man is free to remarry when their spouse died, right? Marriage is... Uh, only broken by death. Um, other than that, um, the teaching is that they still have to stay faithful in the marriage relationship. So if, 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 if the spouse died, there's no question they can remarry. And if we see that in these four passages that Jesus uh, talk about divorce, only in Matthew that there is an exceptional clause. Remember what is exceptional clause is that uh, divorce is allowed when there is adultery, when there is sexual immorality. But in Mark 10 and Luke 16, Jesus did not uh, mention that. At least Mark and uh, Luke did not re record it, uh, Jesus mentioning about this exceptional clause. Uh, so let's see. In Mark 10, what, what, did, what did Jesus say? From verse 2 until 9, And Pharisees came up. And in order to test him, ask, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses allow a man to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. And Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So in this uh, Mark 10, it's very clear that Jesus is explaining to the people that the reason that Moses... Uh, ask the man to give the certificate of divorce is not because God is uh, happy with divorce. God hates divorce, but because of the hardness of heart, because of human sinfulness, because the husband is not fulfilling their uh, marital 
foul. They abandon the, the wives and to provide for the wife to protect the weak. Then Moses is asking uh, them to give them the certificate of divorce. But it is never God's uh, intention. And in verse 9, that Jesus said that what God has joined together, let no man separate. This is the principle of marriage that um, is being taught in the Bible. And also the last text that in the New Testament where Jesus talked about um, divorce uh, is from Luke chapter 16, verse 18. Anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery. And the man who marries divorced woman commits adultery. So it's like uh, divorce is not uh, uh, allowed at all in this uh, Luke 16 to 18. And let's go back to Genesis 2, verse 24 to 25. This is where Jesus was referring in the beginning, right? That God created men and women and then... Um, he says that therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. This is God's uh, design for marriage that men and women united together in, in marriage. And this is for a lifelong relationship. Um, that's why although... The Bible talks about divorce here and there in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Um, but it is more like an accommodation because of human sinfulness. So, is there any grounds for divorce actually uh, from the biblical perspective? There is no ground for divorce from biblical perspective. However, right? However, um, divorce was allowed because of sinfulness of human being because the hardness of heart of human being uh, from the Old Testament time until today divorce was an accommodation to human weakness and was used to bring order in a society that had dishonored God's will and plan however divorce was never the standard that God intended Whenever scripture talks about divorce, it is more of a descriptive, not prescriptive. Okay, what is the difference? Uh, prescriptive is that um, when the Bible talks about a direct command, do this, do this, it's very clear. It's like, uh, it's prescribed for us. Love your enemies, do good to those who persecute you. That is prescriptive, a direct command. But a descriptive uh, means that it's just uh, the facts that the Bible is recording the facts although the facts is not ideal although the facts is not um, is not good but it's happening so the Bible record that that's descriptive so when we read the Bible we need to be very careful that um, we don't say that oh it's okay I mean the Bible talks about divorce Basically, divorce is okay because it talks about that. But we need to know that it is descriptive. It is a description of the less than ideal situation because of human sinfulness. Um, because of that, uh, Matthew, two uh, Bible passages in Matthew, when Jesus uh, mentioned about the exceptional clause, there are three main a uh, few among the Protestant uh, evangelicals uh, practice on divorce and remarriage when there is adultery, when there is a sexual immorality. And uh, let me mention this uh, few. The first one, uh, the first few is that only the innocent spouse can remarry, meaning that uh, if the husband is the one that committed adultery, the one that can remarry is the wife who is innocent or vice versa. And this view is being uh, made popular by Erasmus of Rotterdam. Uh, he was a Dutch philosopher and a Christian scholar um, who made this uh, view popular. And that's why uh, the, the other name for this view is Erasmian view. And uh, there are many there are many 
big pastors and uh, leaders in the Christianity who uh, adopt this denomination in churches who practice this uh, view. And this will, I will say, represent uh, the most of Protestant evangelicals uh, view. Uh, there are D.A. Carson, John MacArthur, John Stott, Paul uh, Feinberg, Robert Stein, who believe this view. And then the second view is that divorce is allowed, but no remarriage. And this view uh, are, the, are the universal agreements since the early church. Uh, during its inception until the 16th century, this is the practice that uh, and the view that is unanimous among uh, the Christians. Um, so, if there is an adultery, divorce is allowed, but no remarriage for both parties. And the third view is the, uh, the strictest view, no divorce and no uh, remarriage at all. Um, so remarriage is only allowed when your spouse died. Even there, if there is an adultery, uh, people are not, uh, Christians are not allowed to divorce or remarriage. And um, there's proponent of this uh, also, John Piper, F.F. F. Bruce, and, and the rest. So um, there are many variations and nuances between few number one and few number two. There are so many denominations and churches who practice uh, different things. This is just the three main few, but uh, in reality, there are so many varieties uh, between uh, few number one and few number two. For example, GICF, uh, most, uh, I think GICF would uh, fall in the category of the few number one, that uh, the innocent spouse, if there's an adultery, can remarry uh, with the understanding that in the Old Testament, um, when there is an adultery, the consequences is death. Uh, adultery is punishable by death, both the men and the women. Both, uh, both parties uh, will be stoned to death. Um, that's why the innocent spouse uh, is considered they're already widowed anyway. Um, that the husband or the wife already died anyway, so they can uh, free to remarry. And there's also that I know um, Watermark Church in Dallas that where uh, we have close relationship with Watermark uh, Community Church in Dallas, that they believe that um, it's, it's a variation between um, few number one and few number two that uh, if divorced people come to them asking for remarriage, they would uh, ask them to reconcile first with the uh, previous spouse that seeking reconciliation is their goal, is their main priority. Um, especially if the uh, previous spouse uh, is not married yet, they will not marry the, the person that want to remarry. They would, they would advise that, why don't you wait? Because God might have a plan to reconcile you to your previous spouse and just stay uh, not married for the time being that uh, seek reconciliation. Unless the, the previous spouse already uh, get married and already start a new family, then they will uh, allow that this uh, person to remarry again after the divorce. So there are many uh, views and variations. So, and then probably you might ask, um, I know, uh, some many women go through this that what about physical abuse right uh, I, I heard so many sad stories that where uh, women are abused by their husband physical abuse I, I don't mean uh, emotional or verbal abuse I'm talking here about physical abuse severe physical abuse that uh, endangering lives and that of the wife and the children because there is a severe physical abuse uh, in the home by the husband and nowadays uh, it's not only the husband can abuse the wife I heard also that today in today's context the wife physically abusing the husband as well so it can happen uh, vice versa what about physical abuse what 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 will happen well what what uh, what's the biblical perspective if there is an abuse abuse happening in the home 
And the universal agreement for severe physical abuse case is the temporary separation to ensure safety of the abused people. Um, sometimes the separation is the only way and the safest way and the wisest way to ensure the safety of the wife and the children if the case is very uh, severe. And how long is the, is, is the separation? We don't know. And it is difficult to give a guideline uh, that fits all situation, that fits all uh, cases. So I would say that we will see case by case that we need to seek the Lord of um, how to uh, mitigate this situation. But, but it is a universal kind of like um, practice and understanding and view that separation is the first step. And then later on, whether divorce is allowed, whether uh, the innocent spouse, the one that gets abused, can remarry, it varies uh, among denominations, among churches in, in the world. There are so many few. So, but I just want to give like a guideline biblical uh, principle is that in any situation, God wants reconciliation, right? In, in, in marriage relationship, in any kind of relationship, God God's heart is for reconciliation. So if there is uh, marital issues, marital problem, I think the, the wisest uh, advice that we can give to people is that seek help, um, get, get counseling, get help, and seek reconciliation first. And sometimes I know this is not easy. Um, it's difficult. Uh, but again, Jesus says in Mark 10, verse 9, What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. This is the principle as much as possible that we want to seek reconciliation. I know um, you might think that it is uh, easy to say, uh, but it's difficult in practice. I know maybe some of you are experiencing pain that your husband left you, uh, for another woman, your husband uh, abandoned you, divorced you, or you are planning to get a divorce because of the difficult situation. Uh, so there are so many um, um, situation that that we are all in pain, in agony, in tragedy, in experience, in relationship, especially marital relationship, because of human sinfulness. Um, and I just want to uh, give you an encouragement and hope, the message of hope that even in this pain, the tragedy or whatever difficulties that we've gone through, God's grace is always there for us. And if we never experience pain, if we never experience tragedy, and if we never um, hit rock bottom, probably we will not be able to be touched by grace. We will not experience grace. We will not be transformed by grace. We will not be marked by grace. In my life, I, 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 I have not experienced divorce, or, uh, but uh, in my childhood, I am the product of uh, uh, coming from a family where my parents separated, and I know the pain of growing up uh, in a family that parents are separated, the wound is deep, the childhood uh, trauma is there, and even I still experiencing the wound until today, that it still affected me today. But I am thankful for whatever happened in the past. If it is not because of that, probably I, I, I am not a believer today. Uh, probably the grace of God will not touch me, will not uh, transform me but because of the pain of going through such a messy uh, background family background that I can um, appreciate and I can taste it God's grace so much in my life so I just want to give a message of hope uh, to you that Christ is inviting you to come to him that probably the reason that he is allowing all this to happen in your life is to beckon you to come to him uh, to have a personal relationship with Him, to tell you that you will never have any satisfaction in life, even in marriage. Jesus alone can fill the hole in our hearts, in our hearts, and Jesus alone is the answer for our uh, pain and and suffering. 
whether today or in the future well, when it happened. Um, so the principle to remember is that uh, there are two points. Divorce is never ideal because it defies God's original design for marriage. It's from Matthew 5, 31 to 32. Marriage is intended as a lifelong faithful union of a man and a woman. And then the second one for single women, right? Do not rush into marriage, but be cautious. Seek counsel from godly people around you. As I prepare this, I remember back when I about to get married, I don't know what the Bible said about divorce, right? And I guess that's true for many Christians. We don't know what the Bible said about, about divorce. When tragedy happened, uh, then we will start to learn what are the options for me? Uh, am I allowed to get divorced? What's the Bible said about divorce? So I would, I would encourage the single women to, to not rush and to not, um, to be cautious and to allow the godly people around us to give counsel because once you are married, you are in it for life. And when there is a divorce, there is pain on, on both sides and also the children. Okay, and let's continue to uh, Matthew 5, 43 to 46. This is about forgiveness. You have heard that you were said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. Um, so Jesus is teaching um, his followers to forgive, to not um, hold the grudges against the enemies. And I just want to also uh, share with you Romans 12, verse 19. It says, this is uh, Apostle Paul says, Beloved, meaning all, all the followers, the Christians, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So the teaching of Christianity is that when we get hurt, we should not retaliate. We should not um, harbor unforgiveness. But leave room and let God avenge. Let God be the one that paid for us. And I just want to explain what mean what forgiveness means from this uh, slides, from this diagram. Um, when God. When we sin against God, right? Uh, God have a choice actually to ask us to pay. Pay for your sin. Because you have sinned, you need to go to hell forever. You need to pay for your sin. But He did not do that. He actually paid for our sin. He did not demand us to pay for our sin. But He paid for our sin by putting our punishment on Jesus Christ. And He sets us free. Right? He says us free. Um, Jesus Christ is the one that paid for our punishment. And then on the next uh, chart, now that we are forgiven by God, that Jesus Christ already paid the penalty of our sins, what do we need to do to others who sins against us? And God wants us to do the same, right? Um, giving forgiveness to others, meaning that assuming personal responsibility for the emotional pain and consequences of another sin. Right? We are the one that pain. When we forgive someone, we are saying that you are free to go. You don't have to pay me. Although you have sinned great, uh, great sin against me, I, I, let, I set you free. I am the one that absorbed the pain. I will pay just like Christ did for me. So when we do that, the result will be freedom from resentment, uh, freedom from bitterness, anger, revenge, and conflict. On the other hand, when we uh, demand justice, when we demand, demand payment, you cannot go free. You hurt me. You have to pay. I want revenge. I want you to go through the pain what I go through. That is revenge, right? Um, when that happens, is that when we demand justice, the result is that we have bitterness, we have resentment, we have anger, revenge, and conflict. And from my childhood, right, there are so many messy, 
messy background, sexual immorality, um, that I see my dad was destroyed by my mom's unfaithfulness. And I have been struggling uh, so many times to forgive my mom and she is the only person on earth that I cannot get close to. That even today, I am still struggling uh, in our relationship. So forgiveness is not just one time. I have to do it again and again and again and again. Uh, sometimes when trigger comes, I have to pass on forgiveness again and again. It is not an option whether I want to forgive or, or not. I have to. I have to forgive. And I have to make that decision to forgive. And when I make that decision, that feeling will follow. God will help me in the process. But I have to make that conscious, intentional decision to forgive again and again and again. And Matthew 6 verse 14 and 15, um, it says that, Jesus says that, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. So it's very clear. It's very scary, right? That's why it's not an option. We don't forgive others. Our Father in heaven will not forgive us. And that is a scary place to be. And the principle that I would like to um, share for this part is that God wants us to love and do good to our enemies. Right? That's from Matthew 5, verse 43 to 48. We must overcome evil with good. Revenge belongs to God alone. So to recap the principles of uh, today's lesson um, from uh, Matthew 5 is that number one, divorce is never ideal because it defies God's original design for marriage. Uh, number two, for single women, do not rush into marriage, but be cautious, seek godly counsel from the people around you. Number three, God wants us to love and do good to our enemies. Now for the applications. Um, from that three principles, number one, for the application, I just want to ask you to um, reflect and try to answer these questions. Is there any lesson about God's design for marriage that speaks to you and how will you apply in this coming week? Uh, number two, for single women, do you have godly counselors to give input into your love relationship? Number three, is there anyone that you need to forgive. Um, I hope that this message, um, Lesson 13 about divorce and forgiveness, will bless your heart. Once again, uh, please do not misunderstand me. I have compassion for people who experience divorce. You are not condemned. You are not judged. You are loved. You are precious still in God's eyes. Your value, your preciousness in God's eyes did not decrease just because you are uh, committing divorce. You are still valuable. In fact, God wants you to come to Him that you are so precious, that you are so valuable, that God wants to love you by allowing difficulties and pain to come into your life. So let me pray for all of us. Father, thank you again for your grace and mercy and love. Thank you for forgiveness and thank you for second chance. And thank you, Father, through the difficulties and pain in life that even there, even at that time, you give us your love. You, you, you show up there and you invite, invited us to come to you. Thank you for um, the invitation of the gospel that only in you alone there is hope for the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you ladies and I hope you will have a blessed week ahead and I will see you next week.